Thank you. So this satellite image that you see here is an image of central Nepal, which was taken on April 25th of last year. Now, 35 minutes after this image was taken, a devastating 8.0 magnitude earthquake struck the country. This resulted in over 8,000 people losing their lives, over 20,000 people uh, injured, and hundreds of thousands made homeless. To make matters even worse, Nepal remained cloudy for many, many days after the earthquake, which made it impossible for us to use satellite imagery to quickly assess the disaster damage and the resulting needs. But underneath the clouds, my team and I were able to use flying robots or drones to survey the damage. And we did this in partnership with our friends at Kathmandu University, who invited us to Nepal to support the local recovery efforts. Now, we didn't fly these robots manually. That would defeat the purpose of using robots. We programmed all 10 of our robots with smartphones. And it's actually quite simple. You simply draw a green triangle over the area that you want to survey and just really press go. And then the robot takes off automatically, snaps the pictures, uh, lands. And once it lands, you take the data, you download it on your laptop, and you stitch all the pictures together to create this very high resolution map of the disaster damage around Kathmandu. And by high resolution, I really mean high resolution. You can zoom down all the way to the street level. And pictures, images like these can be really helpful for assessing disaster damage, especially when you can't access, physically access, those areas, or when satellite imagery is not available, or when satellite imagery is actually too expensive, or when you don't happen to have a very reliable internet connection, you can't even download the satellite imagery. And if you compare the spatial resolution of this aerial image with the satellite imagery that our partners eventually got a hold of after the clouds cleared, you can see that the satellite image is a bit out of focus. And because of, unfortunately, the many aftershocks that happened in Nepal, the satellite image became out of date relatively quickly. Now, with flying robots, we can also create these very high-definition 3D models to assess disaster damage from all angles. And in the near future, we'll be able to import these 3D models into virtual reality environments to create even more detailed damage assessments. But it's important to also have a reality check here. Um, our partners in Nepal don't have access to VR headsets. I don't have a VR headset. And the local communities that we were working with, they don't have easy access to computers either, for that matter. So we decided to unlock this data by printing all our maps on these large banners that we gave right back to the local community. So they, they could see for themselves what the result of all this flying was about. And we invited the community to hack the map. That is, to annotate the map directly with their own local knowledge. And this generated hours and hours of conversations amongst hundreds of members of the local community, discussions and debates about the best way to rebuild strategies and priorities. And because we had done this in public with large maps, it meant that all members of the community could actually participate and contribute to these important discussions on how to rebuild their homes. And so for the first time ever, this community was able to use one and the same data set, this map, to inform their recovery efforts. Now, I do have a somewhat embarrassing uh, confession to make, which is we actually um, we, we missed a really important part of the survey area where there was a lot of damage. But because we had taken the time to train our partners and because we had transferred the technology to them, they were able to go right back and get the job done entirely on their own. And that is what it's all about for me, helping people help themselves with appropriate robotics solutions. Now, partners didn't stop with this one project. They've been involved in dozens of other projects 
since then, including damage assessments in other districts. Just last week, they were doing agricultural surveys for a food security project. And they also recently sent me this high-definition 3D model of a regional hospital, which, again, they did entirely on their own. Now, this was a hospital that we actually spent a bit of time in because uh, we started talking with some of the doctors there about public health applications of flying robots. And the doctors there were really interested to hear that you could use these flying robots to transport medicine as well as to take pictures. And they were really interested in that specific application because, well, in Nepal it can be really challenging to deliver essential medicines and vaccines, especially when the monsoons hit. You have so many remote villages across Nepal, and when these monsoons hit, these villages become completely isolated from local hospitals and local clinics. And not just for a few days or a few weeks after the monsoons, but sometimes for many months, because these monsoons also trigger landslides that make these roads completely impassable. So we invited one of the doctors to fly the robot for herself, just to get a feel for it. And we actually put some pills, medicine pills, into a small plastic bag, attached it to the flying robot. And this doctor was the very first doctor in the history of Nepal to start flying medicine around with a simple flying robot. And this really got the conversation started. They brought us to their conference room, showed us these maps of the different clinics and villages that they service in their region. And while some of these villages are 50 kilometers or so from the nearest clinics, others, like the ones here, are a lot closer. Oda is the clinic here, and it's less than five kilometers from these two neighboring villages. Now, this is a remote area. There are no roads, there are no cars, there are no motorbikes. The only thing you have here are very narrow and sometimes dangerous mountain trails that wind around the mountains which is why it takes up to seven hours to walk from that clinic to one of the other villages. Seven hours. A flying robot could do that in 20 minutes. In the time that it takes a person to cover that distance, a flying robot could do 20 flights, carrying one kilo at a time, the equivalent of 40,000 pills of aspirin over 20 flights. This is a project we're actively exploring uh, for Nepal for next year with this specific flying robot which was just used in Madagascar last month for a very similar project. So we've seen how flying robots can transport medicines. We've seen how they can take images after major disasters. Well, swimming robots also have to, a role to play in humanitarian efforts. And swimming robots are being used in Nepal in the glacial lakes of the Himalayas to detect mountain tsunamis. And these are happening because climate change is having a very real impact on the Himalayas. This summer, in less than 48 hours, one of those glacial lakes lost enough water to fill not one, but 42 Olympic-sized swimming pools in less than 48 hours, and that one lake is one of hundreds of lakes on top of that glacier, one of the fastest changing glaciers in the region. So scientists like my colleague Uliana are racing to better understand how these lakes form, how they grow, and importantly, how they're actually connected to each other. Because the villages that exist below these lakes are becoming increasingly prone to these violent flash floods floods that the locals there refer to as the tsunamis of the Himalayas. Now, to try and create early warnings of these mountain tsunamis, we need a lot more information on the depths of these lakes, how steep they are, what the lake floors look like, what they're made of as well. So, Uriana and her team of Sherpas are using this swimming robot to automatically map the lake floors, to look for those cracks that might trigger those mountain tsunamis. And just like the flying robots that I shared with you earlier, these swimming robots are also programmed to operate autonomously, autonomously and automatically. It's far more efficient, far faster, and it's far safer, because you do not want to be where this robot is. There are avalanches, there are ice falls that make 
being close to these lakes, let alone in these lakes, incredibly dangerous for humans. So we use these autonomous swimming robots instead, and we are able to get live data from these, as Uliana shows here. Here we are looking at the sonar depth, the side scan. Pretty cool, yeah, guys? <laughs> so Uliana and I are also looking at diving robots, this one especially, to bring back to Nepal so we can really get to the bottom of these glacial lakes to identify the hot spots before they become visible at the surface or even from the air. So our plan for next year is to bring these diving robots with swimming robots with flying robots to the Himalayas so that our local partners, the Sherpas, the local engineers, can use these robotic solutions to take the pulse of the Himalayas so that they can provide warnings to the local villages before these mountain tsunamis happen. Now, it's kind of easy to look at all these little flying robots that I've just shown you and to dismiss them as, as toys, as a passing phase. But more and more people, experts and others, are starting to believe that these robots, these flying, driving, swimming, diving robots, are going to power the next industrial revolution. The World Economic Forum refers to this next robotics revolution as the fourth industrial revolution. Now, to be honest, none of us really know yet just how this revolution will unfold. But what we do know is that past technology revolutions have created divides. Divides between those who have access to the technology and those who don't. So our response as a community to this fourth industrial revolution must be a just and inclusive response, one that includes all the stakeholders and especially those local partners and local communities in developing countries. We must democratize this fourth industrial revolution, which is exactly why my team and I at We Robotics are co-creating small local robotics labs in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, so that our local partners gain access to these important professional skills and to the robotics themselves in order to double and scale the impact of their humanitarian efforts. And we're using these robotics labs to also spin off local businesses, local startups. We want to create jobs around robotics. Our local partners want to have jobs that they can work at. They want to launch their own businesses around robotics. And so in this way, developing countries can participate in the fourth industrial revolution rather than get left behind. I'm headed to Nepal tomorrow with uh, my team to work with our local robotics lab in Kathmandu and our partners there to start the process of incubating a local robotics company uh, in the country. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be easy, but it, it really must happen. We cannot afford to have any more technology injustice in this world. We must democratize access to robotics so that the next time that we see an image like this one taken of anywhere around the world, we'll know that beneath those clouds, we've got local responders already using robotics to help others in need. Thank you very much. Thank you.